Welcome back to our eighth lecture in Biblical Counseling. This will mark the one-fifth done with this class, and I think you'll find this to be the most interesting class yet. Uh, if you did the reading several days ago in that article I wrote on the imagination, the one that's at BibleDoc.org, you might want to go back to that article uh, online or if you printed it and go to section three because our lecture today is largely drawn from section, section three. What we're going to do is make an application of the things we've been learning about the imagination to what you would say as a counselor. How might you guide someone who comes to you for counsel? But I'd say more than someone who comes to you for counsel because frequently the people that you want to counsel might not even come to you. You might need to go to them. I mean as a pastor or a teacher or a Bible worker, you are a biblical counselor. You have material to share with people, whether or not they're looking for material from you. So section three, it's called Counseling Applications in that article. And uh, I guess I should get closer to you. I'm just going to read you a bit. So I would start in, in giving counsel with the imagination in cases of moral weakness. So here you are, you meet someone who is struggling with uh, impure thoughts or struggling with some sort of sexual addiction. This is the most common thing I meet as a pastor. Uh, even in the last two weeks, I've encountered someone who has a fairly public life. They've been up front speaking, preaching, doing music, but they've struggled with this for years. How do we help someone? Start with the imagination in cases of moral weakness. Suggest healthy meditation on the word and on noble themes. Read the following statement to the believing counselee. Encourage discipline and bring in the imagination back when it wanders. So I'm going to read you a statement here. I've given you one earlier, Mind, Character, and Personality, page 595. It's very similar to this one. And if you have one, you don't need the other. But I'm going to read the one that's here in the, in the article. This is from uh, CTBH. What is that? Something Better Health. Maybe Councils on Temperance and Better Health. I really don't remember what CTBH stands for. Quote, It is the special work of Satan in these last days to take possession of the minds of youth, to corrupt the thoughts, and inflame the passions. For he knows that by so doing that he can lead to impure actions and thus all the noble faculties of the mind will become debased, and he can control them to suit his own purposes. All are free moral agents, and as such, they must train their thoughts to run in the right channel. The first work of those who would reform is to purify the imagination. You hear that, the first work? So I'm starting here, when I'm talking to someone who's struggling with impurity, I'm starting with the thoughts. Let's cleanse first the inside of the pot, the inside of the cup, and then we'll move to the outside. Our meditations should be such as will elevate the mind. What sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Here is a wide field in which the mind can safely range. So what is that wide field? It's the things that are lovely and pure and true and good report and praiseworthy. A wide field. If Satan seeks to turn the mind to low and sensual things, bring it back. When corrupt imaginings seek to gain possession of your mind, flee to the throne of grace and pray for strength from heaven. By the grace of Christ, it is possible for us to reject impure thoughts. Jesus will attract the mind and purify the thoughts and cleanse the heart from every secret sin. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, casting down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So that's, that's the first idea. Let's start with the inside. The 
the second section, their second quote there, spend time outdoors in contemplation of nature while asking, what is God teaching through these things? I'm going to be saying to someone that struggles with imagination, let's get you out of the city. Let's get you out of your home. Let's get you out into the mountains, into the jungle, into the forest, near the trees, around the lakes. Let me read you the statement. This is from Councils on Health 202. The burden of sin, with its unrest and unsatisfied desires, lies at the very foundation of a large share of maladies. I see I'm not high enough for you to see what I'm doing with my hands. With a large share of maladies the sinner suffers. Christ, the mighty healer of the sin-sick soul, he is. <coughs> Excuse me. These poor afflicted ones need to have a clear knowledge of him whom to know aright is life eternal. They need to be patiently and kindly, yet earnestly taught how to throw open the windows of the soul and let the sunlight of God's love come in to illuminate the darkened chambers of the mind. The most exalted spiritual truths may be brought home to the heart by the things of nature, the birds of the air, the flowers of the field in their glowing beauty, the springing grain, the fruitful branches of the vine, the trees putting forth their tender buds, the glorious sunset, the crimson clouds predicting a fair tomorrow, the recurring seasons, all these may teach us precious lessons of trust and faith. Listen carefully. The imagination has here a fruitful field in which to range. The intellect, the intelligent mind, may contemplate with the greatest satisfaction those lessons of divine truth which the world's Redeemer has associated with the things of nature. So here's someone struggling with impure minds. I'm going to say, let's get you out. Let's put you in a place where you're going to be in constant contact aware of those mighty gifts God has given for our betterment. The next idea. If the counselee will be thinking of heavenly things and noble pictures, he will be prepared to resist temptations to masturbate. I mention this in particular because it's in the statement. Uh, this is from Two Mind, Character, and Personality, the volume 2, page 591. If the mind were educated to contemplate elevated subjects, the imagination trained to reflect upon pure and holy things, it would be fortified against this terrible, debasing, soul and body destroying indulgence. Did you hear that? So it's speaking there of what Ellen White calls secret vice, what we call masturbation. And it says that to put the mind into a high level of thought, to train it to think of high things, gives you fortification against that. Next point. As a counselor, I want to use encouraging words and references to eternal realities to reach the hearts of persons with diseased imagination. Let me read you the statement. When Christ ate with publicans and sinners, the priests and rulers made all the capital possible out of his action. But Christ did this that he might speak to erring men the words of encouragement that the priests and rulers were not willing to speak. He would satisfy the inmost longings of the soul and help the sore troubled ones who needed guidance and encouragement. His words were always spoken with wisdom. They always exalted the truth. He presented principles that searched the recesses of the hearts of those who listened. Listen carefully. He said that which reached the diseased imagination and drew the mind out after eternal realities. Here's Jesus, and he is going into the groups of people who are, are despised, and he's reminding them of the most important things. He's talking about heaven. He's giving them encouragement. He's telling them that they can make it, that they can succeed, that they can climb their mountain. Jesus did this, and in doing it, 
he reached even the diseased imagination. He put an idea into that mind that made a difference for the better. In, uh, I'll read you the next one. I want to find an opportunity to share with the counselee the true force of the will in bringing diseased imagination under control. And for this one, the statement is on this phone. So give me a moment to find it. This is from the fifth volume of the Testimonies 310. You should keep off from Satan's enchanted ground and not allow your minds to be swayed from allegiance to God. Through Christ, you may, you may and should be happy and should acquire habits of self-control. Even your thoughts must be brought into subjection to the will of God and your feelings under the control of reason and religion. Your imagination was not given you to be allowed to run riot and have its own way without any effort at restraint or discipline. If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong, and the thoughts and feelings combined make up the moral character. When you decide that as Christians you are not required to restrain your thoughts and feelings, you are brought under the influence of evil angels and invite their presence and their control. Did you catch what she just said? I know people who are talking a lot about exorcism these days, and that this passage says plainly, how we can invite demons to control us. I'll read it again. When you decide that as Christians you are not required to restrain your thoughts and feelings, you are brought under the influence of evil angels and invite their presence and their control. If you yield to your impressions and allow your thoughts to run in a channel of suspicion, doubt, and repining, so there's three words that describe various channels that destroy your peace. What's that first one? It's suspicion. You can't read people's mind or their, or their plans, but you imagine. That second one is doubt. Uh, you cherish thoughts that maybe the Bible isn't reliable or maybe God isn't with you. And that third one is complaining. Each of these channels tend to corrupt the mind, to corrupt the imagination. If you allow your if you yield to your impressions and allow your thoughts to run in a channel of suspicion, doubt, and repining, you will be among the most unhappy of mortals, and your lives will prove a failure. Dear sister, you have a diseased imagination, and you dishonor God by allowing your feelings to have complete control of your reason and judgment. You have a determined will, which causes the mind to react upon the body unbalancing the circulation and producing congestion in certain organs, and you are sacrificing health to your feelings. So what I said here is that I would talk to a counselee about the force of the will. The will has a force in two directions. On the positive end, the will can align itself with God and can it, uh, give us victory with God's power over our besetments. But on the other hand, the will can, as it were, force the body to conform to the diseases of the mind and can inhibit the circulation based on the thoughts and feelings of the person who isn't controlling his or her thoughts and feelings. This next statement is from page is 2T534, and uh, it's related to number 6. It says, I want to advise weak persons to withdraw their thoughts and affections from themselves and to risk something to benefit others, even at the apparent possibility of great loss. I want to encourage them to think of the lives of others as more valuable because more numerous than their own. Uh, this is a, a profound idea. Uh, what's the idea? It's that we want to encourage people who have their minds are diseased to forget about self and do that by giving them something to think about. You know the pink elephant illustration. You, you can't stop thinking about pink elephants by saying I'm not going to think of pink elephants. 
thinking of pink elephants makes you think of pink elephants. So instead of just overcoming evil with nothing, we're going to overcome a diseased, self-centered imagination by giving someone something to do for someone else. Hey, let me read you this statement because I think this statement is just profound. Those who, so far as it is possible, engage in the work of doing good to others by giving practical demonstration of their interest in them are not only relieving the ills of human life and helping them bear their burdens, but are at the same time contributing largely to their own health of soul and body. Doing good is a work that benefits both giver and receiver. If you forget self and your interest for others, you gain a victory over your infirmities. The satisfaction you will realize in doing good will aid you greatly in the recovery of the healthy tone of the imagination. The pleasure of doing good animates the mind and vibrates through the whole body. While the faces of benevolent men are lighted up with cheerfulness and their countenances express the moral elevation of the mind, those of selfish, stingy men are dejected cast down and gloomy. Their moral defects are seen in their faces, their countenances. Selfishness and self-love stamp their own image upon the outward man. That person who is actuated by true disinterested benevolence is a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, while the selfish and avaricious have cherished their selfishness until it has withered their social sympathies, and their countenances reflect the image of the fallen foe, rather than that of purity and holiness. Invalids, I advise you to venture something. Arouse your willpower, and at least make a trial of this matter. Withdraw your thoughts and affections from yourself. Walk out by faith. Are you inclined to center your thoughts upon yourselves? fearing to exercise and fearing that if you expose yourself to the air, you will lose your life? Resist those thoughts and feelings. Do not yield to your diseased imagination. If you fail in the trial, you can but die. And what if you die? What if you do die? One life might be better be lost than many sacrificed. I'm going to read you more, but I just want to talk about what we've read so far. You see what she's saying. She's speaking to people who are so ill, it seems, that they can't even function. She's saying even to them, forget about your illness and get out and do something for someone else. Just go ahead and be a blessing to someone. Go ahead and serve someone. And if you do that, even if it kills you, many people doing that will be saved from their infirmities. Their own life will respond. It's worth the risk. Risk something for someone. The whims and notions which you cherish are not only destroying your own life, but injuring those whose lives are more valuable than, your, than yours. Now you might say, what do you mean their lives are more valuable than yours? Oh, I mean because there's more of them. You can help more than one person, and the lives of those two or three or ten or fifty people you can help are worth more than your own. But the course we recommend will not deprive you of life or injure you. You will derive benefit from it. You need not be rash or, rash or reckless. Commence moderately at first to have more air and exercise and continue your reform until you become useful, a blessing to your families to, and to all around you. Let your judgment be convinced that exercise, sunlight, and air are the blessings which heaven has provided to make the sick well, and to keep in health those who are not sick. God does not deprive you of these free, heaven-bestowed blessings, but you have punished yourselves by closing your doors against them. Do you hear that? We're talking here about people who, they might not seem like they have mental health problems. They seem like they have physical problems. But their physical problems, because they're holistic creatures, are wrapped up in their minds. Their minds, their strong wills, are making their bodies conform to their diseased imagination. And what can we do as a counselor? We can suggest to that lady on the couch, why don't you 
try to get up today and go out and pick some flowers and give them to someone that you care about. Why don't you go about and do some good? In the process of trying to do something, even if you're afraid it's going to kill you, just try it. it will, you will derive benefit from it. You'll gain. All right. Now to point seven here. As part of regular treatment of needy people, I want to help them to get into habits of thoughtful and meditative Bible study. Whatever the problems may be, this is therapy of the highest order. I'm referring there, though it's not written out, to Hebrews 4.12. The Bible was made to help us to understand our own minds. It was given to guide us in the right direction with our minds. And so when we have, when we do good Bible study, it strengthens those minds, purifies those imaginations. Number eight. I want the counselee to recognize his moral responsibility to use his reason to control his imagination. He should recognize that he may grieve the Holy Spirit by neglect to restrain himself in this way. I'm not going to read you that statement, but you could go back and see it. It's similar to one we've already read. Number nine, for persons with an overactive imagination, I want to counsel abstinence from tea, coffee, and flesh meats, and from other stimulants that tend to vivify the imagination. So let's go up and look at the paragraph that's referring to. It's in it's paragraph 13, as they're numbered at the top. This is from Mind, Character, and Personality, page 589. Tea, coffee, and flesh meats produce an immediate effect. Under the influence of these poisons, the nervous system is excited, and in some cases, for the time being, the intellect seems to be invigorated and the imagination to be more vivid. You know, for people who struggle with impure, impure thoughts, a more vivid imagination is the last thing they need. So the counsel I would give to persons who struggle is to get off of those, that tea, the coffee, the flesh meats, and from other statements, I'd say the spicy foods, make it easier for you to have a less stimulated, less, uh, what's the word that was used there again? Less vivid making a diet, vivid imagination making. I'm sure I could find a better way to say that if I thought about it. Let's go on to the next one. I want to be aware, as a pastor and biblical counselor, that I do not want to aggravate problems with the imagination by exciting and emotional and sensational appeals. You know, what I learned when I was doing this research is that some of the ways that we do evangelism tend to cause diseases of the imagination and to bring in a class of people who are so stimulated that even Bible study doesn't seem attractive to them. Now let's go up and uh, see paragraph 14. This is Mind, Character, and Personality, page 590. Popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the imagination, by exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for what is new and startling. Converts thus gained have little desire to listen to Bible truth little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. What an interesting idea, don't you think? That those popular revivals, by, by making vivid pictures of hell or by communicating uh, scary ideas about what the future holds and impending disasters, the mind becomes overstimulated. And now Bible truth Boring Bible study, uh, that's how it seems to them. That why would they want to see the testimony of prophets and apostles when they could listen to a stirring preacher who can wrap them up and get their imagination startled? We'll go to the next one. For all persons... And for persons suffering from sexual addictions in particular, I want to counsel them to avoid the TV, the theater, 
YouTube, country music, other sensually suggestive songs and readings. These deprave the imagination. I hope that idea just seems like common sense to you, but let's go read those two paragraphs that are related because I was in a home uh, two days ago where I think Roku, is it Roku or, or anyway, where I see the effects of this on destroying the mind. This is page 590 of that same, same book, Mind, Character, and Personality. Low songs, lewd gestures, expressions, and attitudes deprave the imagination and debase the morals. Every youth who habitually attends such exhibitions, speaking of the theater, will be corrupted in principle. There is no influence in our land more powerful to poison the imagination, to destroy religious impressions, and to blunt their relish for the tranquil pleasures and sober realities of life than theatrical amusements. That's quite a statement. Quite a statement. What is the most potent, powerful means of destroying spiritual interest? Uh, of making it difficult to enjoy sitting in the grass by a, a calm stream? What is it that creates the boredom? Nothing does that so effectively as those media, forms of media that take the imagination on its own trip. Here's another one. And uh, actually, it looks like I never put the reference in for this one, so you could look it up yourself by the keyword. It says, you have indulged in novel and story reading until you live in an imaginary world. The influence of such reading is injurious to both the mind and the body. It weakens the intellect and brings a fearful tax upon the physical strength. At times, your mind is scarcely sane because the imagination has been overexcited and diseased by reading fictitious stories. The lust of the eye and corrupt passions are aroused by beholding and by reading. The heart is corrupted through the imagination. The mind takes pleasure in contemplating scenes which awaken the lower and baser passions. These vile images, seen through defiled imagination, corrupt the morals and prepare the deluded and fatuated beings to give loose rein to lustful passions. You hear it. She's making a distinct connection between novels in her day and media in our day and immoral practices, saying that one is a seed planted that gives birth to the, or rise to the next. So yes, someone is struggling with an impure thought, and one of the very first things I'm going to suggest is be done with that, uh, with YouTube, be done with these things. Okay, so let me go to the next one down. I can see from the time I'm not going to finish these. Maybe I'll give you an assignment to go over some of the rest of them. I might let a counselee read this study for him to realize that his imagination must not be allowed to run riot may be entirely eye-opening to him. It was to me when I learned it. So what am I saying? You're counseling someone, you might actually have them read this article that we're going through. Maybe they'll learn things like I learned things, maybe like you learned things. It might be a, just a good exercise. And the next one, I want to counsel women, a woman, to give up castle building and thinking about their own delicacy. Such use of their mind makes real life difficult. It brings on a type of paranoia regarding their not being appreciated. Oh, this is significant. Let's go to paragraph 22 and just look at these ideas. Paragraph 22. This is from the Health Reformer, March 1, 1872. Many have a self-complacent feeling, flattering themselves that if they had an opportunity or were circumstanced more favorably, they could and would do some great work. These do not view things from a correct standpoint. Their imagination is diseased, and they have permitted their minds to soar above the common duties of life. 
daydreaming and romantic castle building have unfitted them for usefulness. They've lived in an imaginary world and have been imaginary martyrs and are imaginary Christians. There is nothing real and substantial in their character. This class sometimes imagine that they have an exquisite delicacy of character and sympathetic nature which must be recognized and responded to by others. They put on an appearance of languor and indolent ease and frequently think that they are not appreciated. Their sick fancy is not helping themselves or others. Appropriate labor and healthy exercise of all their powers would withdraw their thoughts from themselves. So what would I counsel these persons to do? I would counsel them to get involved in the real business of life. And uh, I think seems to me that I read this morning in preparing for this. Yeah, here's another one. This is number 21 here. I have been shown some mothers who are governed by diseased imagination, the influence of which is felt upon husband and children. The, wit the, widows must be the windows must be kept closed because the mother feels the air. If she is at all chilly and the changes made in her clothing, she thinks her children must be treated in the same manner, and thus the entire family are robbed of physical stamina. All are affected by one mind, physically and mentally, injured through the diseased imagination of one woman, who considers herself to be a criterion for the whole family. Yeah, quite an idea. So we want to get women, and men too, but these statements are about women, off of romantic castle building and thinking about how weak and easily injured they are and how delicate and how they must be treated very fine because they have a, the most delicate of emotional makeups and need special treatment when what they really need is just good, hard, normal work. I think biblical counseling might not be easy for people to, um, to put up with. Yeah, I can imagine it. May God give us wisdom in sharing things that need to be shared. Number 14. I may not explain this to the counselee, but I want to give him directions and ideas that will get his mind off of himself. Whether I put him to work or give him an assignment to do something else, I want useful employment to be on my side in helping to cure him. So the idea we have here is that not every idea we have about helping someone is an idea that we ought to say to the person. It might be easier to get them involved in doing something for someone else without telling them how their imagination is diseased. And uh, let's just look at the statements related to this one. It's number 24 and we'll catch 25 at the same time because it's for the next one. 24. Thinking of one's own depravity and weakness, or even more generally, thinking of self. That's the title. There are persons with a diseased imagination to whom religion is a tyrant, ruling them as with a rod of iron. Such are constantly mourning over their depravity and groaning over supposed evil. Love does not exist in their hearts, a frown is ever upon their countenances. They are chilled by the innocent laugh from the youth or from anyone. They consider all recreation or amusement a sin, and think that the mind must be constantly wrought up to just such a stern, severe pitch. This is one extreme. Amusements excite the brain more than useful employment. Physical exercise and labor have a more happy influence upon the mind, and strengthen the muscles, and improve the circulation and give the invalid the satisfaction of knowing his own power of endurance. Whereas, if he is restricted from healthful exercise and physical labor, his attention is called to himself, and he is in constant danger of thinking himself worse off than he really is, and of having established with him a diseased imagination, which causes him to have continual fear that he is overdoing, over-exercising, over-taxing his power of endurance. At the same time, if he should engage in well-directed labor, using his strength and not abusing it, he would find that his physical exercise would prove a more powerful 
an effective agent in his recovery of health than even the water treatment he is receiving. So here we have an idea that some people who, who are thinking of their own weakness and depravity, they need to be distracted. They need to be taken away from their pessimistic, sour thoughts of self and moved into a place where they can see the, the joy and the happy experiences of true religion. Maybe you can do that for someone. I think the Undisciple Camp is a, a place that's done that for hundreds of people. Pulled them out of sourness and put them into sweetness. Let's read 25 here also because it's, it's relevant to the next statement in our list. I am personally acquainted with some who have lost the healthy tone of the mind through wrong habits of reading. They go through life with a diseased imagination, magnifying every little grievance. Things which a sound, sensible mind would not notice become to them unendurable trials, insurmountable obstacles. To them life is a constant shadow. Those who have indulged the habit of racing through exciting stories are crippling their mental strength and disqualifying themselves for vigorous thought and research. There are men and women now in the decline of life who have never recovered from the effects of intemperate reading. The habit formed in early years has grown with their growth and strengthened with their strength, and their efforts to overcome it, though determined, have been only partially successful. Many have never recovered their original vigor of mind. So what do we counsel someone in view of this? This is point 15. I will want to encourage reading of deeper materials and challenging essays. You know, maybe for you it might be selectively watching TED Talks, for example. The counselee's tendency to magnify little grievances is often a result of superficial reading or of superficial TV viewing in our day. Passive experience, as one has when reading exciting stories or watching drama, unfits the mind for vigorous thought and research. So let's see what we can do to displace evil with good. Get the mind off of the, the light reading, the light watching, the entertaining material, the escapist uh, media and literature. And let's put it on, on essays, thought-provoking, research-oriented, maybe even get them doing some of their own research, and see if we can bring back some of that vigor of mind. Because we read here something terrible, and that is some of those early habits can constrict the mind, weaken it in a way that no one will ever be released from. Let's go to number 16. I will counsel students and parents of students that constant study diseases the imagination and, as Solomon says, is a weariness to the flesh. Persons involved in too much mental work and too little physical exertion, they need a change. So you might know uh, persons that study all day, late into the night, that they're on the couch, they're hardly moving. Yeah, they need a change if their mind is going to be in a healthy condition. Just Last week, my wife and I went backpacking about 30 miles in the Bob Marshall Wilderness. That was so good for us. And even just a moment ago, Heidi went out for a, a mile-long walk with the 10 pounds on her back just to kind of keep up those thighs. But what I'm telling you is that when the mind does too much study without balancing physical activity, it leads to an over-excitement of the mind that is unhealthy. The recollection, the learning skills are reduced, the thinking processes are not as healthy. Right, let's go back and look at that statement. That is statement number 26. Statement 26. This is from Spalding McGann, page 95. Let students with their mental studies call into exercise the physical and moral powers let them work the living machinery proportionately. The constant working of the brain is a mistake. 
I wish I could express in words just that which would express the matter. The constant working of the brain causes a diseased imagination. It leads to dissipation, uh, to very bad behavior, careless, reckless behavior, partying. The education of five years in this one line is not much value as an all-around education of one year. What is she saying? She says, here you have someone who studies for a year, does his research, and gets his exercise and outdoor activity. Here's someone who spends five years devoted to just study. Yeah, that's enough to get his PhD. And which one comes away at the end of the year having gained the most intellectually, really? It's the one who did that one year of a mixture of physical and mental activity. Number 17. For persons in administrative roles, I would counsel a healthy dose of optimism regarding the ability of others to handle responsibility. It appears that many good and effective men hindered the work of God through a type of lack of confidence in others' paranoia. What am I saying there? I'm thinking of Jan Andrews when he went to England and thinking of Loughborough there also and Cornell at some times and James White other times and even Dr. Kellogg. But many strong men cherished a type of paranoia over the, the in, inability or the incompetence of those that were under them, those that, that they ought to trust with more responsibilities. So I would suggest to an administrator that he cultivate an optimism about the potential of his underworkers, of his uh, under-administrators. That kind of optimism is good for his mind and good for his company, good for his organization, good for his institution, good for his school. But we want to cultivate that to prevent that paranoia that could work just to the opposite end. And number 18, for persons in administrative roles that struggle with combativeness and control issues, I would in interrogate them regarding their eating and digestive history. What am I saying? I'm saying sometimes the way people eat and their indigestion literally affects their attitude and their combativeness in committee. Let's go back and look at this, this statement. Paragraph 28. This is from 1888 uh, materials, page 294. Now, Brother Fargo, if you did go from that conference and make such statements to Elder Butler, have, have you had no evidence to change your mind? And how could you represent this as you did to Elder Butler, who was broken in mind and diseased in body, who was in a condition to exaggerate every statement made? How can God look upon this work of my good ministry and brethren? If you have acted apart because of blindness of mind in helping Elder Butler to remain under a deception, making statements to him which his diseased imagination would construe into the worst possible light, God will not look on this work with any favor, for if this, for, for if this your work is of God, then he has not been leading me. Well, that's interesting, but it's not exactly what I'm looking for here. Let's read the next one. It says, Could your eyes have been opened as you with others sat in council? You would have discerned the unseen watcher, marking your words and noting the hasty, overbearing spirit which controlled your decisions, especially when something took place to arouse your combativeness. A sufferer from indigestion, you have brought the results of this into council meetings and board meetings. You presided when, owing to your diseased imagination, you were not fit to preside. You were not always in this frame of mind, but at times were conciliating and conceding. Angels of God were present to help you when you did not wish and strive to do the will of God. To A.R. Henry, uh, 5MR 443. From this statement and others, I've seen that indigestion leads to bad behavior. And that when people have anger issues and combative issues and control issues, 
while there are many things we want to be checking on, we might want to make sure they're eating a simple spare diet, one that would not overly stimulate them. Well, I am really running out of time, and there are several more here. Let's see if we can just walk, talk through them, just a few of them. For marital problems, this is number 20. For marital problems, I would investigate whether one spouse's diseased imagination might be discouraging and weakening the other. I might not discuss this, but I would bear it in mind. So here's not something to say to someone, but in a couple that's struggling, check and see if the mental health of one might be pulling down the mental well-being of another. And number 21, I might explain to a prejudicial paranoid person how he has reacted to unjust prejudice against himself, if this is the case. To repent of his tit-for-tat imagination would be helpful in recovering help. Like we'll develop this idea much more later. But the mind, when you're treated badly, the way you react to that bad treatment can start in you uh, a vengeful or bitter experience that does more damage than the bad treatment. So we want to help people work through and see, have they reacted to, to prejudicial statements? Have they been treated in a way that was unkind and allowed that to fester in their mind? Number 22, in my mind as a counselor, I would want to understand the three-step cause and effect of first, cherishing disagreeable thoughts, then becoming nervous and irritable, and finally becoming diseased in the mind. That first one was cherishing disagreeable thoughts, because it might be if we understand that it's disagreeable thoughts, nervousness, disease, right? maybe we can stop that at the thoughts. Maybe we can stop it at the past and do something there. We won't read that statement. Number the last one. I would want to counsel dissatisfied spouses to face the reality, to come down to the simplicity of real life, to take up life's burden in their families as a woman's lot is. And that paragraph 34 talks about this idea for women, to not try to rise above the lot that God has given them in their family. That is the very place they were made for. They were made for that. So I'm going to close this and just review a few of these thoughts. What I'm saying today is that the things we're finding in the testimonies that are so interesting, it's not so we can do well on a, uh, a trivia game someday. You know, we want to make the application in our heads so we can recognize and meet people and help people who are going through these very common diseases by very helpful thoughts. We who are connected to wisdom from the one who created the mind we know something about the kind of medicine that will fix the mind. And if we use that, we'll be effective. All right, let me have a prayer with you, and I will let you go. Our Father in heaven, I ask you to bless us as we talk about these principles. Teach us how to make application well, I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, you're reading. If you did not finish reading that article on the imagination when I signed it last time, be sure to finish reading it now. But I think you ought to spend another half hour reading in it, even if you did finish it, because these statements are interesting enough that reading them repeatedly might be the only way that we can get them into the useful part of our brain, so that we think about them, think about them, think about them. Like, I don't have the idea that I want to teach you this much during the semester, only to have you retain this much. I'd rather, let's learn this much and retain this much. So let's do what we can to get this material into a position where we can recall it and use it. All right, God bless you. Bye-bye.